Right, uh, but however, and now for something completely different. In a testosterone fueled session, we're going to have a look at um, seven discovery programs. Now, in order to understand the incredibly amusing joke behind this session, <laughs> uh, I need to ask how many of you like Westerns? Now, you're under oath, so you have to be serious. <laughs> Please put your hand up if you hate Westerns, actually. Excellent. <laughs> uh, if you'd like, the, the exit's right there. Um, how many of you have seen a film um, by uh, Akira Kuro Samurai? The Seven Samurai. The Seven Samurai, excellent, that's better, you can stay. <laughs> how many have seen a film called The Bug's Life, Disney Studios? 1999. Excellent. <laughs> They're all the same story of the Magnificent Seven. So uh, you'll roughly understand that the Magnificent Seven is all about um, uh, a c community which has been plagued by robbers stealing all their valuables and their food. And, but they were saved by seven um, wonderful people or wonderful teams which uh, got rid of the robbers. Well, that's the basic story of all those films. And that's roughly what I'm going to be talking about today. Th th there is a connection. Uh, and the connection is there are many communities all around the coast of England who are having their coastal, their maritime heritage washed away, being robbed by um, the, the North Sea, the English Channel, um, the uh, Irish Sea, the, and the Atlantic. Now, in order to save those communities from those robbers, I told you it was contentious. Uh, a, number, <laughs> a number of programs have been set up. Well, the first of which, the gang leader, is the Gender Discovery Program. And here you see them having a workshop. <laughs> and here you see, um, I think, someone who's a rather cuddlier version than Elliot Ray. <laughs> now, <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes, that, that's after he had his hair cut. No, that's, yeah, well, anyway. Um, so, the Tent Discovery Program was the first of these gangs that went around saving the country from the ravages of coastal erosion. <laughs> that one. Right. Uh, and what we're announcing today is that the Citizen Project the Coastal and Deep Tidal Zone Archaeological Network is setting up another six discovery programs. So we we'll now have magnificent seven discovery programs. And these are in um, Humberside, Liverpool Bay, Mersey Island in Essex, the Colne Blackwater, the East Cape Coast, Solent Harbours, and Devon Rivers. So uh, very different topographical um, areas and very different catchment areas in terms of um, social diversity. Each of these new discovery programs will be embedded in a local university to ensure that we have uh, a strong research component in the work that we do. So um, how we approach things, in the first year at Citizen, uh, all those years ago, uh, we worked with the evidence from the Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys uh, an amazing pioneering project by Historic England, which looked, which gave a snapshot of the uh, features, archaeological features, which have been eroded by coastal erosion right around the English coast. Uh, this started in about 2000. So uh, already, um, a lot of the features seen in the Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys have gone, and a lot of new features which weren't on those surveys have appeared. So we spent the first year of the first three years of the citizen project trying to ground truth, as they say, uh, the features found during the rapid coast zone assessments right way around the English coast. This proved a little exhausting, so um, in our second phase, the next three years, 2019 to 21, uh, we're going to develop what we call the intensive coastal archaeological surveys, focusing on these areas and looking in great detail and putting them in the evidence into context. So we're not attempting to do the whole coast, uh, we're attempting to do um, a little more focus work, or a lot more focus work, on each of those 
six discovery program areas, the new discovery program areas. Um, we're using the same themes as we developed in the previous year, which are nautical archaeology, coastal defence, coastal industry, lots of landscapes and lots of settlements, but we're setting them all into the wider context of coastal change, sea level change, which are the um, archaeologically viable proxies, quantifiable proxies for climate change. For example, uh, if we look at coastal defences, we find a pillbox which in 1940 was built on top of the bank and now it's on foreshore. That's evidence for coastal erosion as well as evidence for coastal defence. So um, that's the framework we work with. And I'll just briefly run through some of the um, discovery program areas we're dealing with. Up on Humberside, this area here in Yorkshire, for example, massive coastal change on the East Coast. Um, here, these red dots represent um, 36 medieval settlements which have disappeared or have been resettled further inland because coastal erosion is so severe on that part of the coast. Um, over here, this is not in Yorkshire, but shows you in the space of 1998-2007 how the coast at Haysborough, which is just around the corner from that slide, uh, has disappeared. That's the modern coast, and that's the coast in 1998. It's all disappeared. Massive coastal change uh, due to these extreme storm events and rising sea levels. Uh, but I want to say a little bit about the people who work in Humberside. Um, we are always standing on the shoulders of giants, and this particular giant is Fred Wright, who was one of the first people to undertake systematic archaeological foreshore survey. And as a result of that, he found no less than three Bronze Age boats. Elliot would like to find a quarter of one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is what you wear if you're doing intertidal zone survey in the 30s and 40s. And um, this is, this is um, intensive cleaning in 1946 uh, using the local fire brigade to wash the silts off your Bronze Age boat, preferably two. It's also a wonderful caption. I like the captions in archaeological reports. H.J. Plundereth assisting fireman. <laughs> a recaption. Um, so, another marvellous thing that she did was she did regular monitoring. He understood the concept of going back year on year on year, and between 1939 and 1946, he regularly <coughs> visited the same stretches of foreshore to record the boats. These boats are big, and therefore they're recorded 1939, 1940, etc., in bits. They were just never seen at any one time. It was, it was seen in his regular visits. Now, the trouble with poor old Ted Wright is he also, note the dates, he was also in the army. He fought in the East Yorkshire Yeomanry as a lieutenant in the uh, tanks. So he missed some years. These are the years he missed. <laughs> <laughs> so without regular monitoring, you won't get your whole boat. So let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> don't, go, don't go to war again. It's the last time I'll tell you. Uh, but as a result of his dedicated work with his brother and his local community group, uh, they found no less than three Bronze Age boats. And these are the dates they finally came up with. Like most people who are pioneers, nobody believed him at first. But uh, eventually, when the dates came through, often 10, 20 years later, they realized they had the earliest boat in Britain by far. The Dover boat, which you may know about, is a young chicken compared with the ones he, he had. So extraordinary work by a so-called, yeah, I think it's terrible, in his obituary, he was called an amateur archeologist. I think that's an affront to the work that he did because he was an archeologist with a capital A. Now, if we go to Liverpool Bay, another of our discovery program, we have another, quote, amateur archaeologist, I hate that term, 
who um, discovered these prehistoric footprints and got them dated, got them understood, got them researched. A chap called Gordon Roberts, and that's his wife, Patricia, and a very important part of the team is this chap. <laughs> because they went dog walking every day on the same stretch of beach. And as a result of that, they found a particular seat, a, a particular silt so exposed at particular times of day, um, footprints of bare feet, not flip flops, and um, animal footprints of extinct animals and extinct birds. And gradually, <coughs> he eventually persuaded clever people that these were actually prehistoric footprints and started a whole new subject of um, studying prehistoric footprints, which uh, in certain conditions on certain beaches are preserved um, from 5000 BC to 5000 BC to 100 BC, and published a book about it. So these are volunteers who are not amateur archaeologists, they're archaeologists and they find stuff by regular monitoring. So this is the kind of um, background that we're trying to build on. Um, I don't know if Matthew is still there. Is he still yogging up? No, no, he's still here. Um, this is, I don't know if you recognize this. What is it? Oh, I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the... <laughs> this is an enormous fish trap, one of several in the um, Black Cauldron and Cold Estuaries, which, um, again, a, a local guy went out there at very low tides to photograph and record and monitor. And nowadays we say, oh yes, the Anglo-Saxon fish traps of Essex. But again, it was because of the local guys, long before... Citizen or TVP, we're actually recording these things. There is a heritage, a legacy we're working with. And look at the sea salt sites, the so called Red Hills. Again, um, this was the result. We now know these are sea salt manufacturing sites. Um, the first ones we studied were not known really as sea salt sites in 1879. And uh, various Essex groups volunteering a local society got together to study them, the West Essex group and ultimately the um, Culture Archaeology Society, um, studied them and published the definitive work on them, which is still the definitive work on them. Um, so these are not amateur archaeologists, these are real archaeologists doing real research. And oddly enough, this site here, Peldon, was the very first site that was looked at in 1879. Um, so there is a background that we're working with and we want to take these plans forward. Now, once again, these sites relate directly to ancient sea level. These settling tanks must be just below the high tide for the water to get into it. And the burning off, the heating off of the water on the Red Hills must be just above high tide. So the high tide line must run right the way through the middle of that site, in this case, in the Iron Age. Um, and here we see from Peter Murphy's book, where he's looked at um, many other things, including the Red Hills. Uh, here you have the Red Hills um, inland, here, underneath the salt marshes, exposed on the open foreshore here. So there's the Roman Iron Age salt working site. As you move down the foreshore, at the lower level, you get the Bronze Age buttery structures, and at a lower level again, you get the Neolithic sites. So you're able, by looking and dating and leveling these foreshore sites, you can put in the levels of high tide in different periods. So we look at them as interesting sites, but also as evidence for changing sea levels. Same is true of so-called submerged forests. Um, Semi-submerged prehistoric landscapes would be a better term. Here in Kent, for example, um, which in the background, uh, you can see what looks like a classic submerged forest with large boles of the trees and the root systems of an inundated landscape. Inundated when 
sea levels are obviously a lot lower than they are now. But that site near Winston was quite interesting. And so if you think of a coppice woodland, you think of a series of coppice stalls, a series of standards, a series of coppice stalls, and then when the coppice has been harvested, when the, the young stems have been cut and piled up ready to be taken away, um, the <coughs> landscape looks a bit like that. Loads of poles and the occasional uh, felled stand. Bear that in mind and have a look at this long rock site. And you'll see we have standards. And look at that, a line of poles cut from coppicing. They're all the same age, as it were. So they are um, a stack of pole which you cut usually in the winter and it's just been inundated and sealed by rising sea levels. So it's not, uh, sub submerged forests are not always merely wild wood, but they're actually uh, a worked woodland, a managed woodland, inundated by rising sea levels. And by looking at the tree rings, we can see that the latest ring is about 1874 calendar BC. Uh, and we can even do more than that. We can have a look at the width of those tree rings, relatively wide, very narrow here, pretty narrow and narrower. You know, rings uh, uh, get wider and narrower every year, depending on storms and things. And you'll notice that the ring width of those trees gets narrower and narrower here. In fact, from this point onwards, they're narrower every year, or narrower than the average which means that, in living memory, the people who were living there, coxing their woodland, could see, um, were, it, were being impacted by the increased salinity levels in the ground, stopping the trees growing, and they could see that by this point, inundation <coughs> happened. So, in the lifetime of those woodland managers, their land was inundated. I, coastal change, uh, rising sea levels, can hit you very suddenly. They didn't have time to clear their coppice. So um, we do have to, you know, this time we're looking at how is sea level rise gradually. If you look at the evidence from London, we have evidence for sea levels, highest anticipated time, 700, uh, 1000, 1300. And if you draw a line through those rising levels, you, you get a trajectory going up like that. And if you actually look at the levels we've got, they're actually higher. So we had a gradual rise here, and then a very sudden rise sometime after 1700, 1750. So sea levels rise not gradually, but suddenly, and sometime with uh, extreme speed once you reach what's called a tipping point. I must send this to Greta one day. <laughs> uh, we also have a discovery program in Solar, but I'm not going to talk about that because there's someone who knows far more about it than me and I'm running out of time. So, I'm now going to sum up um, to record our threatened coastal heritage assets. First of all, we have the Thames Discovery Program. <laughs> 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 and then they were joined by six more flagship discovery programs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.